Before I read today's gospel lesson, let me say what a joy it is to finally be here among you. I feel like I know you indirectly. Um, I also send greetings from Fairmount Presbyterian Church where Amy is filling their pulpit this morning. Both Amy and I and the leadership at our church hope that this pulpit swap is just the beginning of a renewed partnership between our congregations. Individually, we have accomplished a lot within these walls, within our neighborhoods, but together, in partnership, in collaboration, I know, we know, we can do even more to bring God's love, God's justice, and God's peace to a city and a world that desperately need what we and God has to offer. Today's gospel reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12. You can follow along, 49 to 56. This is Jesus speaking. We're going to jump right in where he's talking, and he's going to sound a little bit different than you might be used to. Listen now for God's word to you. I came to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism baptism with which to be baptized, and what stress I am under until it is completed. Do you think that I have come to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three, they will be divided. Father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, uh-oh, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say, oh, it's going to rain. And so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, there will be a scorching heat. And it happens. You hypocrites. You know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? This is the word of the Lord. Before he met her, Doug had been very nervous about attending his very first spin class. He'd heard horror stories from friends at how difficult a spin class could be, how brutal the hour on that bike could be. But when the teacher greeted him at the door with that warm smile and a cheerful disposition, Doug thought to himself, this won't be so bad. Good morning, class, the teacher began. My name is Tammy, and I'm standing in today for Tom, who's sick. I'm so glad to be here today. I hope you're ready to spin, because today's class is going to be a lot of fun. At that greeting, all the anxious spinners in the class looked at each other and let out a corporate sigh of relief. This is going to be a piece of cake the guy next to Doug whispered. Then it happened. The music started, and Tammy, sweet Tammy, transformed into the most demanding, intimidating, and cruel spin teacher on the planet. All right, class, she bellowed. Pedal like your life depends on it. Go, go, go. And it was the longest hour of Doug's life. So what was your first impression of Jesus? When you first met him, when you first heard his teachings, what did you think? Who did you think that he was? What did you think he was like? Up to this point in Luke's gospel, he's made a pretty good impression on most people. Sure, he's been a bit confusing and demanding at times, but in general, Jesus has come across as a pretty nice, reasonable guy until today. Do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? He asks. Yeah, um, we do. No, I tell you, I have come to bring division. From now on, five in one household, he goes on, will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, and then he divides up the whole family. Father will go against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, as if it wasn't hard enough already to get along with your in-laws. Now this. Now, to be clear here, today's passage is not permission for you to write off your in-laws 
or that person in your family who pushes all your buttons. Sorry, but that's not what this is about. This is also not permission to go out and seek conflict for the sake of conflict. That never really works, especially in family systems. Now, today's lesson is a simple reminder to us of what can happen to our primary attachments when we seek to follow Jesus. Like every other couple on the planet, Tom and Susie had their share of troubles. But as they sat across from their pastor, it became clear to her pretty quickly that it was not their recurring arguments over money or the kids that was destroying their marriage. What was tearing them apart as a couple was Susie's willingness to forgive Tom, to forgive him for all the things that he had done. And Tom had done some pretty unforgivable things. And yet, for some reason, Susie was ready. She was ready to move on. She was ready to forgive. She was ready to show him mercy. But Tom would have none of it. And it was this unwillingness to accept her forgiveness, to accept her grace to admit his sin that was a driving wedge in their relationship. Now, Susie had been willing to maintain the status quo of tit for tat that had defined their relationship from the very beginning. They would likely have not have been in that office that day, not sitting in their pastor's study, talking with their pastor about the possibility of ending their marriage. But she had had enough of living that way, of keeping score, she believed there had to be a better way. Conflicts, in my experience, conflicts are not what tear apart nations, faith communities, or families. Conflict is a necessary part of life. That which does not adapt dies, and adaptation involves change, and nobody likes change, and so we have conflict. But conflict, in my opinion, is not what divides. The wedge that Jesus talks about in today's passage, the dividing fire that he refers to, isn't judgment, it's mercy. The same mercy that allows for wholeness and peace, the same forgiveness that can restore broken relationships and heal broken hearts, that same mercy can also drive a wedge between family and friends. And that's because we live and work in a world where we are all constantly, all day, all the time, judging and evaluating and sorting. We are all being judged, being evaluated, being ranked, being put in our place every second of every day. And it's into this crazy world of tit for tat that Jesus comes to us and shows us a better way to be in relationship with each other. Starting at the fringes of society and working his way inward, starting with the least deserving, the most sinful, and working his way in to the ones who saw themselves as the most righteous, Jesus keeps preaching the same message of radical mercy and life-transforming grace. It doesn't matter if you're on the edge or in the middle, he preaches the same thing. Forgiveness is available to you here and now. And it's this message of hope and acceptance of all people that divides mother against daughter, son against father, and friend against friend. Jesus was not killed because he sought out conflict with the powers that be. He was killed because his message of mercy was a threat to the way the world worked. I have a colleague who once served a vibrant upper-middle-class church in a suburb of a large American city, and no, it's not Fairmount, but it looked like Fairmount. When graduation season rolled around, he informed the governing board of the church that instead of honoring the high school graduates by announcing in worship their college of choice, their accomplishments, and their class rank, instead of doing what they'd always done, both he and the youth leader would invite the kids forward and talk about their faith. It seemed harmless enough. 
He wanted to emphasize their value in light of God's love for them, rather than assign them value by what they had done in comparison to other students. Well, when word got out that the graduates would not receive their due in worship, the church went crazy. Nasty emails flooded my friend's inbox. Parents he had never seen before were in his office telling him what they thought of his crazy idea. It was chaos. And as my friend engaged in damage control, he went to the clerk and asked to see the worship records of attendance there at that church. And graduation Sunday was number two, right behind Easter morning. My friend's stubborn, some pastors are. He stuck with his convictions and refused to acknowledge students' class rank, college choice, and career accomplishments in worship. He talked about their faith for three years, only three years because he left that church. He wasn't well received. And the year after he left, guess what? Graduation Sunday came right on back. I once heard the gospel of Jesus Christ described like this. In the middle of our struggle to prove ourselves by comparing ourselves, Jesus blows the whistle, announces the end of the game, and declares all of us winners. He then goes on to inform us that all the huffing, puffing, piety to earn God's favor is over, that all the sweat-soaked straining to secure self-worth is finished, and that all the competitive scrambling to get ahead has ended. God is on all our sides, he declares, regardless of how well we've played the game. And in a world that thrives on competition, in a world that assigns value by comparison, in a world that loves to evaluate and judge and sort and rank, that is anything but good news. In fact, blowing the whistle and ending the game is the most divisive thing Jesus could ever have done. You might be surprised to learn that seminarians, those folks that are being trained for ministry, are competitive, very competitive. One of the biggest events at Princeton Theological Seminary has been for years is the championship co-ed flag football game. I kid you not. My junior year, my second year at seminary, the championship game was between a class of juniors, my friends, my peers, and a class of seniors who had won, a team of seniors who had won the game the two years prior. Well, by chance, a friend of mine at the game ended up officiating the game. He hadn't planned on being the official at the game, but the scheduled referee wisely didn't show up. So my friend was asked to step in. He was asked to step in by the captains of both teams. They felt he was fairly impartial. Well, on the final drive of the game, with the score tied, the senior team was marching down the field. And on the game's final play, the quarterback threw a pass to a receiver who played Division II college football. The man jumped in the air, caught the ball, and landed in the end zone with both feet in bounds, scoring the winning touchdown. Or at least, that's what my friend saw. What happened next is something I'm never going to forget. When my friend raised his arms to signal touchdown, the losing team, the team of his friends, laid into him. They called him names. They said he was jealous of their success. They even accused him of letting the other team win as a way of getting back at them for not choosing him to be part of their team. My friend was speechless. When he tried to explain to them what he saw, they simply turned their backs and walked away. A few hours later, there was a knock on my friend's door. It was his best friend, Sherry, who was on the losing team. My friend thought she had come to apologize for what had happened, but she didn't come to apologize. She wanted to forgive him, she said, to move on, but she knew if she did, there would be hell to pay. She wanted to move past what had happened, but she knew that doing so would mean losing friendships in the process. I went to a reunion a couple years ago, and we still can't talk about that game. The forgiveness Jesus offers, 
the grace he extends, the way he orders things, the way he extends mercy to both sinners and saints, to winners and losers, is the most divisive thing he ever could have done. Because when he did that, he announced the end to the game. And oh, how we love to play the game. You may not be a sports fan, but you're still playing. You're playing at home, you're playing at school, you're playing at work. And I'm guessing you might be playing here at church too. We love to play the game, even though it's a game that no one ever wins. In the early morning hours of January 10th, 1966, Sam Bowers, who was then the Imperial Wizard of the White Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, drove out of Hattiesburg, Mississippi to the house of Vernon Dahmer. While Dahmer and his family slept in their home, Klansmen doused their house with gasoline and set it on fire. Dahmer's 10-year-old daughter was injured in the fire and Dahmer died from his injuries a few days later. 30 years later, 30 years later, after four missed trials and 30 years of injustice, Sam Bowers was finally convicted of the vicious murder of Vernon Dahmer. One of the people in the courthouse for Bowers' 1998 trial was the Reverend Will Campbell, a maverick Baptist preacher who played a key role in the fight for civil rights in the South. While serving as chaplain at the University of Mississippi, Campbell had gotten to know Vernon Dahmer while working closely with him on voting right issues in the state. Campbell was assumed to be at the trial 30 years later to grieve the long ago death of a dear friend. Courtroom reporters were shocked, however, to see Campbell being embraced as an old friend, not only by Ellie Dahmer, Vernon's widow, but also by the defendant, Sam Bowers. He embraced them both that day in court. When one of the reporters covering the trial asked Campbell how he could possibly be so friendly with both the victim and the vicious monster who committed the crime, the ever salty-tongued Campbell replied, because damn it, I'm a Christian. Abraham Lincoln was once asked whose side of the Civil War he thought God was on. He wisely responded, sir, my concern is not whether God is on our side, my greatest concern is to be on God's side. Jesus makes it clear in today's passage and all throughout scriptures, it's in the Old Testament too, God is on the side of the most disruptive force in the world, unconditional, undeserved, and at times incomprehensible love. Forgiveness is the most powerful force God has ever unleashed upon the earth because it had to be. It had to be to separate us, to divide us from our beloved delusion that it's by our actions that we earn God's favor. I have not come to bring peace, Jesus says, but rather division. And nothing is more divisive than love freely given. Amen.